So I'd like to introduce our speakers. We have Barb Taylor, Althea Manassam, and Sage Lovell joining us today to present. Um, they have long and impressive bios, so I won't I won't read them all out. Uh, but Barb is a or she has been a mobile application product owner for Canadian Tire, CBC, and Chorus Entertainment, um, as well as a digital manager for uh, both CBC and Chorus Entertainment Radio. Um, she's also an award-winning animator. Althea is a digital producer for CBC Radio, uh, where she creates online content that includes articles, videos, and multimedia features, and she manages digital projects for national radio shows. Sage is an artist, educator, and writer. They are focused on advocacy, which led them into creating art as political statements um, and also establishing deaf spectrum where the focus is on promoting the accessible usage of ASL. Um, and Sage is deaf and will be signing today as, she, as they present. And Amanda and Carmel will translate. Um, so that's everything from me. Again, if you have any questions about using Zoom, feel free to post those in the chat and I will pass it over to our speakers. Thank you so much, Joyce. Um, <clears throat> First of all, I just want to say a big shout out to Joyce and BC Alliance for Arts and Culture uh, for hosting the workshop today. Our goal with, uh, we've been doing a series of workshops across Canada, and our goal is to share our knowledge about search engine optimization and discoverability online with artists and art organizations. So I guess I do want to note that we have this workshop where we present a lot of detailed information. So, um, I know that in some of the previous workshops, uh, it was a lot for people to sort of take notes. So what we're gonna do is we've got a couple of ways in which you can obtain the information afterwards. Uh, we're videotaping as Joyce mentioned, and the videotape, is, the video is going to go on the BC Alliance's YouTube channel. And we're hoping to capture both ASL and we'll do a captioned version as well. And then secondly, there's uh, some research that's gone into this presentation and that is going to be found in uh, detailed text format on the IMA Independent Media Artists Association website. And the link is at the end of the presentation. Then also some uh, option, some selections from this presentation will be going on the BC Alliance for Arts and Culture blog. So there'll be a lot of places um, and maybe Joyce, I'm hoping Perhaps you could, we could email everybody afterwards with the links to all that content. Um, so it's easy for you to look at afterwards and you know, think through more detailed questions because of a lot of research um, that's available on this topic. Okay, so uh, our main goal is to share how artists and art organizations connect with audiences given new digital technologies. We've got two things going on, new di digital technologies and on the second hand, new ways in which um, uh, content is being created. So we're gonna first talk about what is search engine optimization and why does it matter? Althea is gonna give some great tips on how to actually um, improve your search engine optimization practice. Following up that, Sage will talk specifically about reaching audiences with disabilities. She's got a lot of great tips on how to do it and how you can change both your website and your content in order to do that. Then I'll talk a little bit about the future uh, because Sage and Althea are talking about the now, what you can do right now, but things change so fast in this field. I'll share a little bit about what we think this future is going to bring. Finally, because this whole presentation, within the presentation, we talk a lot about Google, Facebook, YouTube, all these big internet giants. I want to share some information about alternatives and what we've been able to learn about that. One of the factors that has led us to do this workshop is the change in the way people are accessing content. People can find content everywhere. Like for example, the woman in the image, the photo here, she's looking at her smartwatch. Maybe she's trying to find out uh, what's the art show in the gallery she just passed or getting information on an event coming up that night. Sorry, just to interrupt you, Barb. I don't know, have you started sharing your screen? Oh my God, really? Oh, <laughs> thank you. <gasps> I should have. Thanks, Althea. Okay. Okay, can you see that? Yes. All right, thank you. Okay, 
So the woman in the photo is looking at her smartwatch and maybe she's checking out what's in a gallery next door that she's just passed on her bike or she's looking for the time of an event that night. So because of the proliferation of internet of things devices, people can access and Wi-Fi, people can access content all over the place. In addition, the growth of 5G means that lots more content can be found in many more places. We have to remember though that in Canada, the flip side is there's still about 10% of Canadians that don't have access to high-speed internet. It could be because they live in a rural area or it could be because um, they're poor and they don't, can't pay for internet. They perhaps go to the local library to access internet services. Because of that, we have to think about how do we format our content um, so that everybody can access it. And the good news is in this presentation today, the basic uh, uh, message, I guess, is that content should be simple. It should be formatted in standard ways. And following these guidelines, you'll be able to get your content out to all of these audiences. So now we're gonna start with Althea and she's gonna take us through um, what's the details on search engine optimization best practices? Sure. And then I'm just going to take a second to share my screen. Okay, good. <laughs> Here we go. So can you all see that? Okay. So I'll get started right away. Um, I'll just say if you have any questions or you need some clarification while I'm speaking, please feel free to unmute yourself and speak up. I actually can't see the chat. So um, I think Barb will watch it, but I actually won't be able to see anything that you type into the chat box. So feel free to unmute yourself. Um, so search engine optimization, uh, what is it exactly? Uh, basically it's a set of techniques that you use to help make your website uh, rank higher on search engine results pages. So if someone enters a search query into Google, into Yahoo, into Bing, you're trying to rank up in the search results pages as high as possible. Um, so why does this matter? It's because people who do perform searches um, don't actually go past the first few pages of search results. So if you want your website to actually be discovered by people, uh, you'll wanna put some of your efforts into optimizing your website for search. Um, so a couple of things before I get sort of into the detailed uh, tips and techniques. First thing to keep in mind is that SEO takes time. It's, it's something that you have to keep working at. It's a long game. So even once you start implementing some of these techniques, uh, don't expect to start rising up in search results immediately. You're gonna have to keep at it. You're also gonna have to do a little bit of experimentation. Um, the other thing to know is that there is in fact a way to rank immediately on search engine results pages, and that is to buy ads. So that's a whole other field uh, that's called paid search. There's a whole set of tips and techniques for that if you wanted to get into that. Uh, but we're gonna focus on SEO, which is all about organic free search. Okay, so here, before again, I get into the tips and techniques, I just wanna give a little bit of background on how search engines actually work, how they find and index your content. So first of all, search engines, Google, uh, they have uh, web crawlers. They have the software known as web crawlers or spiders or bots. You'll hear them uh, called any of those three things. Um, and they go out and they scan pages and sites across the internet. Um, they go through links, so any kind of hyperlinks on your websites, um, they make their way through all these links and they find other pages and they gather information. And this is why you'll actually find, as I talk a little bit more about SEO, that links are really, really important when you are um, doing search engine optimization techniques. Um, then what they do is that they take all of this information that they've gathered and they organize all of it into a search index. So like a, an index of all the information. And then when somebody searches something, uh, the search engines use an algorithm uh, based on what the person is searching, based on the content of all the information on these web pages, and then they will determine what to return to a particular search query. So what results they'll give somebody. Oops. 
So when they're determining uh, what search results they're going to give to somebody, they are taking into account uh, two factors of a particular website and that's relevance and authority. So relevance, you can think of simply as how relevant is the page, the content on your page to what the person has searched for. So if a person is searching for, for example, art therapy techniques or um, art therapists, is that what your website is about? Um, the second thing that they look at is authority. And that's, uh, that's sort of like what kind of influence does your website have? And that's based on a, some criteria. So for example, uh, is your site older or is it newer? If it's an older, more established site, um, it's deemed to have higher authority as opposed to a site that was just created yesterday. Also, how big is your site? If you have sort of a big site that has lots of pages um, as opposed to you know, a site that only has just one page, uh, it'll have higher authority if you're a larger site. And then also how popular is your site? How often do people visit it? How many people visit it? If it's a well-trafficked site, then you are deemed to have higher authority than a site that not very many people visit. So now we kind of get into the nitty gritty and I'm gonna talk about keyword research and planning because this is um, pretty much the foundation of SEO. Because if you think about the way that you uh, search for things in search engines, you're typing words into the search engine. You're typing keywords and phrases. So when you are coming up with SEO tactics, um, you're basing it on these keywords. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to come up with a set of keywords and phrases um, that you'll optimize each page on your website for that you're hoping the people that search for these keywords will bring them to that particular page of your website. Um, one thing to think about when you're kind of brainstorming this list of words that you want to bring people to your website is what um, is the user intent? Like who is your target audience and what are they looking for? How are they trying to find it? And does your website actually offer offer to the user what they want. So when you're trying to pick these keywords, and we'll go into a little bit of an exercise later, brainstorming some keywords, um, there are a few factors that matter, things that you'll want to think about when you're brainstorming. And um, it's relevance, volume, and competition. So relevance, again, like I said before, it's are these particular keywords, are they relevant to the content that's on your web page? Um, if you are, uh, you know, if it's a filmmaker portfolio, are the words filmmaker in there, for example, is it relevant to what's on your page? Um, and when you think of relevance, you can think of them in terms of specific keywords or broad keywords. So a broad keyword, for example, might be simply photographer. So if you're a photographer, um, something more specific might be like Toronto wedding photographer. Uh, and these more specific keywords, you might've heard uh, the term long tail keywords uh, thrown around if you've ever looked into SEO. So these more specific keywords are, are referred to as uh, long tail keywords. Um, volume is the next thing you wanna think about. And that is how often it is a potential keyword actually searched for. So if something has, if there's a keyword that more people are searching for, it does have a, a higher amount of traffic that it could potentially bring in, but there is kind of a balance. Cause if we go back to my previous example, um, you might think you wanna rank for the keyword photographer cause it's more broad, but if you are a Toronto wedding photographer, somebody in New York or Florida who's looking for a portrait photographer or a street photographer, uh, your website's not gonna be relevant to them um, or it, it won't be as relevant to them as a, like someone who is in Toronto looking for a wedding photographer. So you do have to balance volume, even though more people might be searching for a photographer, they're not looking for that particular kind of photographer. 
Um, and then the last thing you want to think about is competition. And that's how many other websites are trying to rank for that particular keyword you're thinking of. Um, if there's a lot of websites that are trying to rank for that keyword, and in particular, if they are websites with high authority, a, a website authority that's even higher than yours, you're gonna have a really hard time um, ranking for that particular keyword because you're basically competing against them. So when you're thinking about those three criteria, your goal really is to think of keywords that are relevant to what's on your site, that have a fairly good search volume, but that are not so um, competitive that you're unlike, uh, unlikely to rank against other websites that are already ranking for them. So now um, I'm just gonna take you a little bit through the normal process of doing keyword research. Um, so your goal, Again, um, maybe we can do a little bit of brainstorming and you guys can talk, unmute yourselves and maybe someone wants to talk a little bit about what kind of websites they have right now that they are trying to think of, um, they want to do SEO for. And maybe we can try to think of some keywords that might be relevant to that particular website. So I'll open the floor if anyone wants to volunteer. Anybody? Sorry, I can't really see. Um, I know there's some uh, participants who have organization websites. Uh, we'd love to hear what kind of organization you're with. And ah, film producer with a portfolio of films. Okay, that's a great one. Nice. Great, Maria. Anybody else? I see that Terry has his hand up. So Terry, if you if you want to unmute yourself and speak, go ahead. Um, I, I write a, an art blog. So it the topics change every couple of weeks because it depends on what I write about, but mm -hmm. I'm interested in ideas as well. Oh yeah, well, that's totally great. Blogs are a great, um, uh, like they're a great kind of site to do SEO on because um, I briefly mentioned it before, but you are doing different keywords for each page. So each time you have a blog post, you're kind of going through this process for each post um, and coming up with different keywords. And it's actually a great way for different kinds of audiences to find you because if you have like one topic, um, uh, you might be able to find like a different kind of audience that maybe is, doesn't usually visit your website. Right. Um, but uh, so, we go back to kind of the process the first thing we'll want to do is have like a uh, just think of like what are some of the themes that are relevant to what your website is about so you said um you have an art blog like what kinds of art do you write about um mostly about things that i've uh, seen or, or or been audience participant in um that i want to share that i think is great so it could be from anything from a theater uh, presentation to a, like a visual art show. Um, the last one I did was on a visual artist um, who, whose work I had seen in New York and in Chicago. Oh, that's great. So yeah, you have like visual arts, performing arts. So these are kind of all of the different topic areas that you would have. Um, then once you have that, um, once you've thought of that, then you wanna start generating specific keywords. And this is when you would get into the specific content of what's on that page. So like you said, maybe like New York performance artists might be a potential uh, keyword or phrase that you're thinking of, or like uh, visual artists in New York or theater performances in a location, or um, I don't know what kind, like what kind, what was, what kind of play was it that you had just seen? Oh, that was a, I was just thinking about that one from a couple of years ago. It was actually uh, here in Victoria, BC uh, at the Belfry Theater, um, but it was a Toronto performer. Okay. Um, yeah, so you can think of keywords for that, the, the kind of performance it is, like ballet performance. Uh, just got an amber alert here. Um, 
Yeah, so you can think of different keywords. Um, again, you're kind of brainstorming different keywords for a particular page. You wanna come up with as many as you can. It's a brainstorming process. So it's like, just write down as many as you can. Um, think of, like I said earlier, there are broad keywords and specific keywords. So you want to um, play around both because what you'll do after you've collected or generated all of these possible keywords that you wanna use for your page or your site, you're gonna start using tools online to help you learn a little bit more about each keyword. So that's when you get into keyword research tools and I'll just show you how to use some of them. Um, so Google Trends is a really simple, basic one and you guys can still see this, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So Google Trends, um, shows you, as it's in the name, how various keywords are trending over time. Um, so if we want to enter a keyword, um, why don't we put New York art shows. So if we search that, you can see um, the default is a year. So you can see the interest over time. Um, it looks like it tends to be more popular in sort of December to March and a little lower during the other times of the year. Um, but this is a good tool if you want to see if a particular keyword is trending up or trending down. It's especially good, like we use it a lot in news if you want to see what particular keywords people are searching for. Um, you can change it so that uh, you can change it by location. So right, the default is US, but you can change it to Canada. So right now there's enough search data. I find United States is a good. Because you're using New York, maybe. Yeah, that's probably it. You can also change the timeline. So you can do for the past five years, um, past decade, as long as you want, as long as you want information for. Um, you can even, if you're a video artist, this is useful. If you're trying to do SEO for videos that you've uploaded to YouTube, you can actually do just YouTube search and see how a particular search term, I guess most people are not searching New York Art Show on YouTube. You can also do um, image searches, but you're kind of filtering the different searches that Google has. The nice thing too is you can, if you have like two uh, very similar uh, search terms and you're trying to figure out um, like which one of the two is better, you can compare search terms. So I'm gonna go with, this is the one that we've used before. But um, I think if, say we wanted to, to do a horror movie. Say you're a filmmaker, you are, oops, trying to rank for like a horror film trailer. You can search up horror film. Um, and I pointed this out before, but the trend you can really see here because you can see how it, um, really peaks around Halloween, which makes sense. Uh, and then if you are thinking horror movie or horror film, you can compare the two and you can see horror film by and large um, trends higher than horror film. So more people are searching for horror movie. Uh, and then if you go down here, you can also see a little bit more information. So it's broken down um, by sub region, um, they also have related queries. So you can see sort of what kind of related search terms um, people are using and think about whether that uh, makes sense for the content that you're trying to offer. So that's one tool that you can use. Very easy, very simple to use. There's another tool that's very popular. A lot of people use it called uh, Keyword Planner. Um, the thing about Keyword Planner, just to keep in mind, is that it is designed for paid search. So what I was talking about earlier, um, it's designed for people who are buying ads. So a lot of this might not be super relevant if you're doing organic or free search, but it's still um, a nice indicator that kind of gives you search volume and, and gives you an idea of how these possible search terms um, might fare. 
So if you hit discover new keywords, um, you can sign up. You have to sign up for a Google ads account, but it's free and you, you can sign up easily if you have a Gmail account. Um, so if we are searching for things with business, let's just go, I'm gonna go with Toronto um, visual artists. Uh, English is the default Canada as the location. Hit get results. Oh, it's pretty low. Why don't we? Hey, Althea, how about contemporary classical music? Oh, sure. Contemporary. And you can also add multiple keywords. So you could just add just classical music. So you can search, you can search all the keywords that you want at once. And then these are the results that it gives you. So you can see here are the ones that you provided, contemporary classical music, classical music. Uh, what helps here is this, um, this column of average monthly searches you can actually um, filter by. Uh, so you can see here, um, not surprisingly, classical music ha has more average monthly searches than contemporary classical music, just because it's a more a more broad search term. Um, it sort it gives you a range, so it's between a hundred to a thousand in between 10,000 to 100,000. Um, below it, you can also see there are a bunch of suggested keyword ideas based on your keywords. So you can go through this list and you can look for things that maybe are relevant to that particular web page and see um, if something makes sense for you. And what I did earlier, you can, you can actually rank it by that column so that the ones, oh, other one. So you can see the higher ones up top. So Beethoven is very popular. So maybe think about if you're doing a post on classical music, maybe think about using the, um, the composer's names. Uh, these things you can ignore because again, they're more for, for paid search. They don't really relate to the competition, the kind of competition that I was talking about earlier, because this is a competition for people who are bidding on ads. So it's, um, more paid and it's low because probably a company is not gonna pay to try to rank for Beethoven, for example. Generally they pay to try to rank for like, if they're selling something. So a lot of like product and service oriented keywords, um, not so much like art related ones. And these bids as well are all related to paid. Um, but you can play around with this tool. There's also another way that you can use it. Um, if you have a website that's sort of similar to yours, um, like a competitor website uh, that's kind of similar in size. You don't want to pick a site that is, you know, much bigger or very different from yours, but you can do start with a website and, uh, okay, I just said not to use a big one, but I'm thinking of IMDB. Um, you can just enter their URL and then it will scan their website and then come up with sort of keyword ideas for you based on the content that they have. It's all I have to be really Steven Spielberg contact information. But this is like using another similar website to yours to come up with some ideas for um, keywords that you might want to use for your own website. And then the final tool I'm going to show you, it's called Moz Keyword Explorer. There are a bunch of tools online, by the way, um, just SEO, uh, like SEO analysis tools. Um, I'm gonna use the one called Keyword Explorer. This one is free to a point. Um, it doesn't want you to pay for it, but you can have a limited number of searches and some functionality. But let's search again. What did you say about contemporary classical, yeah. classical music? Yeah. So if we search by keyword, just let it go a little bit. 
my internet might be slow. So here it's again, US is the um, region. You can see it, it shows you the monthly volume, um, about 100 to 200 per month. Um, I like Moz because it has a difficulty score. So it does its own thing and it kind of grades the difficulty of ranking. So this is a 48, so it's sort of in the middle of difficulty. Um, and then org organic click-through rate is just like how many people actually click through when um, on those results on that keyword. Um, but really you're looking at monthly volume and difficulty. It also comes up like Google Keyword Planner with some other keyword suggestions and it shows you the volume. So you can, um, again, it's a way to kind of compare keywords and figure out the ones that might be best for your site. So once you've gathered all of this information um, and you'll do this for each keyword, um, then you can you know, build a spreadsheet, write down all the keywords, kind of write down some of the data that you've gathered on them. So the search volume, the difficulty score, and then you can make your decisions based on that, uh, on what keywords you'll wanna use. You'll wanna, it's for each page, you'll wanna try to rank for like a keyword phrase. So you'll have like one primary keyword phrase per page, maybe a secondary one that you'll try to squeeze in here and there, but really you should try to rank, focus your attention and rank on one. Um, but the main thing when you're doing all your keyword research, I should mention, is that all of the difficulty score, the search volume aside, the main thing is it should be relevant to the content that's on your website. So don't pick something just because it scores well, make sure it's relevant to what you're offering. Hey Althea, there's a question. What does the difficulty refer to? Uh, again, it's like how difficult is it for your page to rank kind of on the first page of search engine results. So if someone searches on for that particular keyword, is it difficult to rank? And again, that has a lot to do um, with competition. So there are certain things where if you uh, enter a search word, like the first page of results are going to be like all from YouTube or from uh, Pinterest or like these, um, those websites have really high authority. And so if they're already dominating those pages, it's gonna be so difficult for you to, to kind of squeeze your way in there. So that difficulty score sort of is, um, gives you an idea of like, should I even bother with this keyword or is it already dominated by um, a bunch of other websites? Second question, how many times do we need to have the keyword key phrase in every page? Uh, so one to two uh, in the copy, but I will mention that a little bit in this section on on-page SEO. Um, so we'll get into that in a second. Um, so once you have your, your list of keywords mapped out to this is the keyword for this page, this is the keyword for this page. Uh, now we're going to look at what do you do with these keywords? How do you start implementing SEO techniques on your page? There's two different kinds of SEO on page, which is all the stuff you do to your website on your website and then off page, which is um, sort of everything that's around your website, almost like marketing and things like that outreach. That's not what um, that's not actually on your web page. Uh, so before you get into content, um, first you wanna make sure that you have a well-organized website. So site architecture. Um, this is again, the foundation, a well-organized website makes it easier for those web crawlers from the search engines to actually find and index all your pages. Um, so a nice thing to do, oh, I did not bring it, but, uh, if you can make like a little visual map of the pages on your website. So you'd have like, for example, the home page up top, maybe you have like uh, an about page underneath that, a contact page. And then if you, it's a film portfolio website and you wanna have a bunch of like your different projects, you might have a section that, you know, says portfolio and then under that you'll have like project one is a page and then project two is another page under that project three is another page under that um so you just want to map it out in a way that actually makes sense and and um makes it so that each page is easy to find so if you can do that then you know that your site is well organized um 
you want to try to make it so that each page is sort of as few connections away from the homepage as possible. Um, again, that just makes it easier for crawlers to find all the pages, but it also makes it easier for people visiting your site to find all the pages. Um, so other tips, just make sure you have a navigation bar up at the top so that you can people can move around the website more easily so that they can more easily find content, have links on your pages that connect to other pages in ways that make sense. Um, so for example, in your bio, if you say, contact me, um, maybe you wanna make that be a link to your contact page. Um, uh, again, it's just make your site easy to navigate for people and for crawlers. Um, then once you have this well-organized site, site structure that you've built, um, you want to generate something called an XML sitemap. And this is essentially like a text document that is like a roadmap of your website. Um, and this document, you'll actually want to submit to all of the search engines. So you'll want to submit it to Google, you'll want to submit it to Yahoo, you'll want to submit it to Bing. Um, and you can actually generate it through free tools online, just uh, site XML sitemap generators. Um, just you to just enter your URL and they make it for you. It's like a text document. And then um, you'll submit it to the different search engines. They'll each have like a different entryway. So you'll just have to, you'll just have to search how to, how to submit to each search engine. But the whole point of doing that really is it just helps the search engines index your site faster. So instead of like sitting back and waiting for them to come find your website, especially if you're a new website, um, you're telling them like, hey, I'm here. Um, I've added new pages. Um, please index my website so that I can show up in search engine results faster. Uh, the next thing you want to look at. Oh, Althea, just before you move on, there's another question. Yeah. Uh, would it be smart to have the homepage for a filmmaker to have carousels of all the trailers of all their films? Um, so I do mention this later, but I would suggest no. I mentioned this a little bit in the video section, but um, so the search, the crawlers tend to stop crawling the page after the first video. So it's actually ideal if you make each video a prominent feature of each page. So if you have one page that's stuffed with videos, um, it's not great for SEO because you basically just have a bunch of videos on one page. Again, you're trying to go page by page. So it would be better to have like one video per page. Um, but yeah, we'll talk a little bit about um, SEO video techniques in, in a bit. Um, but again, going back before keywords, uh, before we start using keywords, you also wanna make sure your website loads quickly. So uh, you can use a tool called PageSpeed Insights, um, enter your URL, um, it just helps you know how quickly your page is loading. If you have, if you use like the regular platforms like uh, WordPress, Squarespace, etc., it shouldn't be a problem because they'll have um, you know reliable platforms. If you're self-hosting your own website, then just make sure you do your research on providers. Make sure that they are fast and reliable. Um, and then whatever you do pick, you just want to make sure all your media is properly compressed um, to make sure your load speeds are fast. Okay, so now we can actually start getting into keywords um, where we can actually use them. Uh, so the first thing obviously is your URL. So, I mean, if you haven't yet set up your domain name, that's the first place you wanna try to get possibly a keyword. Um, if it's a personal website, think about, you know, how you're branding yourself, even if it's an organization or organizational website, like what kind of words do you want in your URL? If you're like a photographer, maybe instead of just having your name, you have you know the word photography in there, like your name photography. Um, if it's like a website for a film project, um, often you know instead of just having the name of the film like thecellphone.com, try to have like 
the cell phone film.com or the cell phone movie. Again, it's just getting words that indicate what this website is about into the URL. And then beyond the domain name, once you're creating individual pages for your website, just make sure you're getting your keyword for that particular page into the URL. So this one um, is getting a little bit into the code, but you'll want to, again, also get your, um, the, your selected keywords into the titles and the headers of your page. So a title, you'll know if you look at your browser, if you look at the very, um, if you look at the tab that it's on, um, the title is sort of the words that are on the tab. It's also, if you are uh, looking at a search engine results page, it's the actual title of the link. It's the part that you would click. So you wanna to try to get your keywords in there. Um, you also want to get it into the headers of your page. Um, usually it's like the largest text. If you go on a web page, usually it's the largest text on the website. It's like the, the headline of the page. If you're writing a blog, usually it's like the title of the blog post. Um, so again, another place you wanna to try to get your keywords. If you were to look at the code of your website, which you can do if you were to like right click and view page source, the title would be in the little uh, title tags. That's how you could tell something is a title and you could tell something is a header because it's in the H1 tag. There's also H2, H3, but H1 is like the primary header tag. Next place you wanna um, look at is your meta description. So this is like the little snippet of text that you'll see um, on a search engine results page that is like the summary of what the page is. Um, it doesn't have a huge effect on your ranking kind of on, on a technical sense, but um, for people who are looking at the results page, it, um, it gives them information and makes them more likely to click on something if they know exactly what it is and what they're getting. So if you have people who are more likely to click on your website, um, that means more visitors and that in turn helps your ranking. So if again, if it's like a personal website, maybe you would have something like, this is the official website of so-and-so, a uh, Vancouver-based cinematographer. Uh, if you don't enter your meta description, um, the search engines will just pull sort of the first bits of content text that's on that page, which might not be ideal. Um, so just make sure it describes what's on the page. You're writing it for human eyes to click on. Um, yeah, um, and you'll know uh, if you're building your website on like WordPress or something, Usually it's just a matter of making sure you fill out a site description. So just make sure that stuff is filled out. So another thing um, that you can look at for SEO is something called structured data. And it's um, sort of a new thing and it's a little bit more technical, but it's a way of classifying content on your website that um, tells search engines exactly what type of content something is and um, this helps the chances of getting your page appearing in what's called like rich snippets in search results. So I think the best example uh, is if you're searching for recipes. So if you look for like Thanksgiving in the US, so let's look at pumpkin pie recipe. So if you look at the search engine results here, um, at the page here. Um, this is like rich, rich results right here. You can see they have like cards. And the reason that Google is able to pull these in is because there's something on each of these person's websites in their code that says, hey, this is a recipe. This is the title of the recipe. This is the timing of the recipe, how long it takes to cook. Here's the rating and here are the ingredients. And so Google takes all that information and is able to build these rich results. So um, recently they also introduced this sort of um, code markup for movies. So if you're a filmmaker, it's probably, it's worth looking into that because you can then mark up like, this is the title of the movie, the director of the movie, you can add a movie image 
And that'll just help your chances of appearing in these kinds of carousels if you're working up your data lines. It does require coding. And like I said, it's a little bit more advanced, but it is something um, worth looking into. So next up, content. Um, obviously the main goal of search engines, they're trying to deliver the best possible results to the users. So the most important thing you can do probably is to optimize your website to have just really quality content that people wanna read. Um, and as I mentioned before, you wanna to try to include your target keyword in your copy like one to three times on your page. Um, your copy should be well-written, should be optimized for people first. Uh, you also want it to be scannable so that people can easily find the information they're looking for. It's also good, you know, not just for SEO, but for accessibility purposes. Uh, you want your website to be engaging, attractive, readable. And part of the reason for this is because the longer that people stay on your pages, the better your search engine rankings will be. Uh, which makes sense because if, if Google or Yahoo finds that people are staying on this page longer after they've clicked through, they know that it's, it's content that people wanted. If someone clicks through to your website and it's a mess, they just can't find what they need. Um, they don't even want to deal with it because maybe it's like big blocks of text that they don't want to bother sifting through. And then they immediately leave your website as soon as they click through it. Um, that's known as bouncing and that increases your bounce rate. And that tells search engines that are able to tell what people are doing, um, that tells them that hey, this person went on this website and then they left. It must be not what they were looking for. Um, let's not send more people there because obviously this is not like a good place to send people. So that hurts your, um, your, uh, your ranking. So you wanna make sure that your content um, looks good. And again, have your keyword a few times. Um, I say one to three times because if you're trying to use a keyword too often on your page, um, the search engines know what you're doing, especially if you're using it in an unnatural way, because you know we're sort of entering the world of, of AI where people, where search engines can kind of tell the context now of what you're writing. So if things read weirdly, um, they'll know, you, they'll, They'll figure you might be engaging in something known as um, keyword stuffing, basically trying to game the system, and they will penalize you for that. Um, another thing to uh, keep in mind for content is um, the search engines obviously pay more attention to regularly updated pages. So if you're um, just regularly adding and updating your pages, that lets crawlers know that it's still an act, active website. So if it's a portfolio, just try to add um, your projects consistently. Um, and like I said earlier, a blog is great to really work on SEO because you're regularly adding blog posts. You can keep um, playing around with SEO on different pages and um, generally blogs tend to be pretty active. Hey Althea, is this yeah. a good point to ask the question, uh, what would you recommend for people to want to build the website themselves? Squarespace, WordPress, Wix, um, is it a good way to go for SEO? Like, do you mean picking between them? Um, or just, yeah. um, I mean, I don't know that, I feel like each platform has its own advantages depending on what you're trying to build. So like, I would recommend doing research depending on exactly what you're looking for. Um, but the platforms, each one does sort of have tools related to SEO that you can use. So, I mean, WordPress is a very common one and they have a plugin that you can use that is very popular that um, analyzes your website for SEO and helps you come up with um, SEO techniques or helps you implement SEO techniques into your website. So I don't know that I can like recommend one in particularly. I also haven't... Um, used all of them. So I can't really give a personal recommendation, but I think it varies. And I think you just need to do your research into each platform. If that answers your question. Um, and so the, the final point on on-page SEO I, I will make it is um, you wanna make sure your website is mobile friendly. So 
that just means that your website works on mobile devices. And that's really easy if you are using one of the aforementioned um, typical website platforms. Um, they will have templates that are responsive, which means that it works well on desktop and mobile. Um, but if you set something up from scratch, you just want to make sure the mobile version works properly. Um, it was actually a few years ago that Google announced that they are now prioritizing the mobile version of your site when it comes to de determining your search engine results ranking. Um, so that actually matters more than the desktop version. And it's because more people are checking for things on their phone. So they just want to make sure that when they are sending people to a website, um, the mobile version works properly. Hey, Althea, before we move on to off page, <laughs> another good question. Is there any point in retroactively implementing SEO techniques to older posts? Yeah, yeah, I recommend that too. Um, and that's something that you should try to do anyway. Um, SEO requires a lot of experimentation because something that you tried the first time might not catch and you might think of a different way that you could have done it. Um, so definitely go back and update things for sure. And you can actually, I mentioned this at the end, but you can go, you can use um, analytics tools to see how um, the traffic to your website changes depending on what, um, what changes you've made to your site. Uh, so now we get into off-page SEO. Again, it's everything that's not on your actual website, but everything around it, everything that's happening off-site. And the most important thing of that is link building. Um, like I said earlier, links are, are one of the most important things in SEO. Um, what you're doing when you're engaging in link building is you're trying to get other pages across the internet, other websites to link to your website. Um, the reason these links are so important is because every time another website links to your website, the search engines treat it as though it's like a vote of confidence. It tells them that like your site has something that's worth looking at. So, um, uh, Having said that, I'll mention that quality matters. So uh, links from pages with high authority are determined to be more valuable than you know, links from a random web page that doesn't have very much influence. Um, you also want to make sure that you're getting websites to link to you that are actually relevant to your own web, web page. So things that have to do with kind of your topic area. Um, so your goal when you're engaging in link building, you wanna get links from pages that are have both high authority and are relevant. Um, one of the ways to do that is to create content that's worth linking to, um, particularly original content, maybe something that people can't find anywhere else so that it makes sense to link to your page since you're the only one that offers it. Oops, sorry. Um, one way to get other people to link to you is actually just outreach. So if you make connections with similar artists, uh, organizations, websites, and then just find ways to share links to each other's pages, um, especially websites with high page authority. So an example uh, of, of high page authority websites, like nonprofit and educational websites actually are seen as more trustworthy by search engines. So if you've worked on a project for, you know, an educational organization or a nonprofit, maybe they're willing to write a blog post about you or wouldn't, willing to let you author a blog post or just provide a link back to your website. Um, guest authoring content on other websites is actually a common blogger tactic. So bloggers will often write guest posts on other blogs uh, in order to reach new audiences and also provide links back to their own blogs. So that's a good example of outreach. Um, another way to get your link out there uh, is to sign up for content aggregators and like local business listings. So if you're an organization, sign up for uh, Google My Business, it's free. It's like um, another way for people to find you um, through uh, Google business listings. Um, if you're a filmmaker and you're working on a project that you know, um, makes sense uh, or that qualifies for IMDb, make sure that you try to get listed on IMDb. Um, there are also artist directories in different cities. So if you're an artist, try to get listed on those directories as well. It's just like, again, a way of getting your link out there. Um, 
But while you're doing that, one thing to keep in mind is you want to avoid something which is called link spamming. So it's sort of like gimmicky, scammy things of is there ways of getting your link out there that are not not as honest. Um, so you know, like don't try to get your link out there into out of context places like forums or um, I'm sure you've you've been on blogs and, and read the comments and there's people spamming and putting their links in there. Avoid stuff like that. Don't trade, don't try to trade links with websites that are not relevant to your own. Um, Cause not only is it not helpful but it actually is uh, counterproductive. It can actually hurt your ranking. Uh, if the search engines um, work out what you're doing um, they'll actually penalize you. To the point that there's a, uh, actually, there are things called backlink analysis tools where you can enter your URL and it will help you figure out what websites your links are on. And one of the thing, one of the reasons that exists is because um, you wanna see if your links are up on websites that are kind of scummy or irrelevant to yours and you, you wanna get delisted from those kinds of websites because it only hurts you. Um, so moving on to another way of getting discovered that's not necessarily um, SEO, but social media. Uh, whether it's a direct factor has been up in debate in SEO circles, but having a good social media presence still helps you by promoting your content in these platforms and getting your site out there, finding new audiences. So a few tips on just social media activity. First off, add social share buttons to your pages so that visitors who are on your page can easily, easily share the link to your page, make it easy for them. Um, try to build a social media presence where it makes sense and where you can actually maintain it. Like I don't recommend you just try to sign up for anything and everything because you feel like you have to. But if you are, for example, a visual artist or a photographer, it makes sense to have an Instagram account. Um, trying to think of other examples, but Pinterest is another very, uh, another image focused, kind of like lifestyle oriented site. So if that's something that you're doing, um, say you're selling candles or blankets, like Pinterest makes sense. It makes sense to have a, an account on Pinterest. Um, the other, like the other reason to have uh, social media accounts is because these social media pages themselves can rank in search engine results which is another way for people to find you. So Pinterest in particular um, seems to rank really highly in Google image search. I don't know if anyone has ever searched for image has found that, but I find like in image results, Pinterest is always the top, the top ranking results. Um, and they have high domain authority. Uh, hey, Althea, and, before you go on, there's a question about the yeah. previous slide. Yeah. Um, it was, what are the back backlist tools and how would you get delisted? Um, so backlink, uh, they're called backlink analysis. You can do just do a search for it. Um, and it depends on the website, but it might just be going like contacting the administrator of the website and saying like, I don't want my, uh, link here or this was posted in error. Um, yeah, it'll, it'll depend. You just have to get in contact with the administrators of whatever website you're trying to get delisted from. But there are backlink analysis tools like Moz, one of the websites that I showed you, the last one, they also have a tool. I don't know if it's free or not because I haven't actually tried it, um, but you can find them easily. There's like a ton of them, ton of tools out there. Hope that answers the question. Um, yeah, so final point for social media here is uh, when you are, for the social media sites that you are, are a part of just make sure that you research and include relevant hashtags. Again, it's it's just another form of discovery to help people find you that might not otherwise. So I'll quickly talk a little bit about optimizing images because you know I think as artists a lot of our websites we want them to be beautiful. We're trying to showcase um, our um, images or videos online in, in beautiful ways. Um, so you just wanna make sure that they are actually optimized for SEO. Uh, so some tips here. First tip, I mentioned this earlier, 
but you want to make sure that all of your images are properly compressed so that they're not slowing down your website. Uh, I won't get too much into the technical details, but just make sure they're the proper size for where you're placing them. Make sure it's the right file format so that they're not too large, um, that they're slowing down your website, but so that they're not so small that the quality suffers. Um, so before you upload that, just make sure that they're properly um, compressed. Uh, the other thing to think about is when you, before you upload your images to your website, when you're exporting them, um, include those SEO keywords, include them in the file names. It's just another way, it's just another place that the crawlers look for keywords. Um, and the uh, final point is you'll want to use descriptive alt task, text when you're uploading um, your website or your photo to your website. There's you, almost always a place to include alt text. And Sage is going to talk a little bit more about this because it also has a lot to do with accessibility. Uh, optimizing videos. Um, so a few SEO tactics to help rank better. Um, a note for optimizing videos. One of the things you'll have to think about is where you want to host your videos. Um, you know, Vimeo is where it is really popular with filmmakers, has um, a lot of great features. I'll just put out there though that YouTube is the second largest search engine behind Google. So if you're trying to rank for something, it's, it's a good choice, you know, if for search engine purposes. Um, and another thing to keep in mind is that if you are choosing for whatever reason not to upload your videos to these uh, video platforms, but you're, you wanna host videos on your own website, make sure that whatever platform you choose, whatever hosting service you use can actually handle streaming videos because that's again related to your website load speed. You don't want your website crashing when people try to watch your videos. Um, uh, so a few tips, um, keywords, again, uh, when you're uploading your videos, use keywords in the video title, in the description, and, and also the tags. Um, they, even though you're using keywords, you also wanna make sure that it's engaging for human eyes. Um, so don't just put a bunch of keywords into the title. Um, another thing to think about is if you're uploading like a video, like a short film or a trailer or something. Uh, don't just use the title of your film, maybe in like brackets or um, you just wanna have like a little bit of a descriptive note of what it is. So like, com like a comedy short film, just so that it reflects the content of your video because most people won't know what it is. And it also just helps for uh, SEO. Um, another tip is to use an eye-catching image thumbnail. Avoid just using like a random still from your film. You wanna make sure that you're custom making something. Um, adding text is a good idea. It's very eye-catching. I think if you just look at, even if you just look at YouTube's default page, you can see all of the thumbnails have text on them. They're very eye-catching, they're very bright. Um, so just make sure that you're kind of following along those same lines. And I mentioned this earlier, but if you're embedding your video on your web page, try to make that one video the focus. Like I said, crawlers, they'll usually stop crawling for video after the first one on the page. So if you have multiple video projects, you wanna try having a separate page for each one. Hey Althea, just to follow up that question. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> YouTube has, I'm not YouTube, WordPress has a template which could aggregate a group of pages, each with an individual video. Would mm -hmm. that solve the problem? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's like, I think you call it projects or portfolios. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah, I think that is a good, a good way to go about it. Okay. And then finally, um, after you've implemented all of these SEO techniques, or not even all of them, just some of them, you don't have to do all of them, uh, you'll wanna measure the results. Like I said, SEO is a long game, so you wanna track everything to see if what you're doing is actually working. So you can use tools like Google Analytics. Um, that'll tell you what kind of traffic you're getting. There's also Google Search Console. Uh, 
and these are free. If these are, if you have a Google account, these are all free, by the way. Uh, Google Search Console, you can enter your URL and it will tell you uh, what search terms actually brought people to your website and where they're coming from. So that's a great tool if you want to know specifically what keywords brought people to your site. And you can see if the keywords you're using actually have any effect. Um, but as I said before, you can go back and change things. Like you want to keep learning, keep adjusting. If something you thought would work isn't working, you can try something else. So it is, it is an art um as well it requires experimentation so just play with it and yeah just keep learning that's it so as if there are no final questions um i can hand it over to sage any final seo questions nope Nope. Looks okay. like not. I know there was a lot of questions though throughout. Yes. A multiple page website. Um, I would say if you really only have like one keyword that you're trying to rank for, then go for having just one page. If, but if you have sort of some variety in your content, especially if you are like say you have a couple of different things that you do like you're not just a cinematographer but you're also a photographer um you you want to maybe have separate pages for that and not try to lump in those different things into one page so again if your content is very simple and it's just like an intro page to who you are this is like the one thing that i do a page would be fine and you're trying to rank for one keyword um but otherwise, yeah, I think more pages are just more opportunities for more keywords. You wanna make, um, so I, for the URL, I wouldn't try to put a bunch of keywords because keywords, um, they're really only like one to three words. It's just like a short phrase. Um, so that you would wanna to try to get that into your URL. And I'd say get your keyword into in um, as early as possible. So at the beginning of the URL, kind of after the backslash, um, I don't know. I don't know that it's long or ugly depending on how long your keyword is, but there are link shortening tools. Like if you're trying, if you're just concerned about how it looks for like promotional purposes, you can use like bit.ly link shortener and that shortens the link for like display purposes. But you do wanna try to get your keyword into those URLs on the actual page. Yeah. Great questions. or tags um so tags are kind of like tags are a place to put keywords else if that makes sense so the keyword phrases are like you can put them kind of throughout the page in your headlines and whereas tags are just sort of like they it's just like a form of categorization or it's almost like a hashtag right so you can use a keyword in the tags. You can use your keywords in the tags. Does that answer the question? Okay. Okay, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll hand it over to Sage now, I guess. Thanks, everybody. You can add SEO questions at the end also. Yeah. Hopefully you can hear me. This is the interpreter speaking. If there's any problems with my microphone, please just let me know in the chat 
or feel free to interrupt. All good, Amanda. Hello, everyone. My name is Sage Lovell. You'll notice that I'm using American Sign Language and the interpreter, Amanda, is speaking for me. My part of the presentation is to discuss your audiences with disabilities and how to alter your content to make it more accessible for that audience. So in terms of arts organizations and artists, we really need to think about how we create our content in accessible ways to meet the needs of a variety of people. And that's what I wanna talk about today. So in terms of access, I mean, it's the human right is the first point to make. Um, I wanna talk about including the disabled community, the inclusion of that community, and also how we do need to understand a disabled user's needs when we're looking at our content. So in terms of human rights, when we talk about disability, each person has their own needs for access. So I identify as a deaf and mad person. I deal with mental health issues. But compared to a person who maybe has, uh, is losing their hearing or to someone who can maybe speak for themselves or someone who prefers captioning, we all have our own specific access needs. So each person has very unique needs. Also, a person with disabilities may have more than one. It may be a more complex situation. It may be a very nuanced, layered situation. So again, when we're thinking about access, it may be very different if we're talking about a deaf blind person, audio description may not be very beneficial as compared to a person who is blind and who can access that audio description. So there's quite a lot of nuance when we're talking about the dis disability community. So why do we even want to include this audience in our minds when we're thinking about online content? Well, our population in Canada is becoming older, is aging. And typically as we age, our bodies start to deteriorate. We potentially lose our hearing, our eyesight goes, we deal with our own health problems and those come with age. This could be for a variety of reasons. It could be environmental factors. If we're talking about water or air pollution, there's lots of different things that can affect our health and cause disabilities. Um, across Canada, we have 22% of our population who identify as individuals with disabilities. That's about one fifth of our population in our country. So one out of five people. Sometimes uh, it's important to clarify that when we're talking about disabilities, they're invisible and visible disabilities. Invisible disabilities could be chronic pain, uh, mental health issues, sleep disorders, all sorts of disabilities like that that you don't see immediately when you see a person versus a visual or a, a visible disability. A person's using a wheelchair. Perhaps they're using sign language. Maybe they're wearing a hearing aid or they have a cane to get around. Perhaps they're an amputee and you can see that there's a loss of limb. So often what happens with invisible disabilities is that their needs are typically overlooked because we don't see them. So we don't think about them. The number of individuals with disabilities is increasing and it is said will increase over the next number of years. So that audience is going to grow. So it's a good idea to think about it now and ensure that your online content is accessible to all for that future audience. The other thing to mention is that you may be able-bodied today, but you could be disabled tomorrow. All of us have that risk. And because of that, as I say, the numbers are going to grow exponentially and we wanna ensure that our content is ready for that. And we wanna include that audience because it's a large audience. So if we're talking about numbers in Canada, I did say 22% of our population. 22% um, actually is about 37, three. 
about 37 million when we're talking about 22%. So we have 37 million in population and about 2.9 million, pardon the interpreter, about 2.9 million of those individuals have disabilities. And statistics say that in 13 years, we're going to see that grow from 2.9 million to over 3.6 million. So that's a huge increase. That's about 700,000 more individuals. So the statistics I'm working with are from two years ago, just to make that clear. So those numbers may be different if you looked at stats from 2020. I'm working with 2018. Um, we have COVID right now, and there's lots of individuals who are dealing with COVID and then ongoing health issues after the fact. So those numbers may change quite a bit as we go through this pandemic. So how do we make our content accessible? How do we figure out what to do, how to start? Research is a first step. It's very important. Spend time searching for that information. As I said, it's a, it's a very nuanced community. There's no one perfect solution for everybody. So do your research. Use primary and secondary sources. So when I'm talking primary sources, I'm referring to publications, journals, articles, interviews. Uh, survey data is very helpful. And those can be found through library systems. Um, even search engines, you can find specific stats um, and that sort of thing online. But I think between the two, library is very helpful because usually they have up-to-date information. Um, a search engine will give you really broad, broad results. Um, I find that libraries are very specific to areas and countries, so you're able to get more specific information that way. But either way, those are ways that you can find that information online and through actual paper. And it's important to just mention that when you're looking at those resources to look at when they were written um, and look at, at what time they were written, what year they were published. Um, also to get a sense of where that information is coming from. Is it new? Is it old? Like if we're looking at 1980s, 1990s, it's, it's, it's aged. And as we get into the 2000s, we start to see better quality information. Um, people change as well, which is why that's really important to think about the time of an article. Another thing to mention that, that I've noticed is when you look at older research too, often language has changed. So you may see slurs and ways of referring to people that we don't use anymore. So you want to keep your research up to date. And when we access all that information, we can then look at our technology today and get a sense of how we can apply all that to our content and ensure that it's accessible to the most diverse audience. So research, first step, lots of stats, lots of numbers are very helpful. The second step that I would recommend is consultation. And that's actually speaking with individuals with disabilities. Ask them questions. Ask them what they like to see, what works for them, what are their recommendations. And really, once you've created that content, whatever that content may be, this consultation can continue to that point. You can show individuals, this is what I have. And you look through it, give me a sense, does it work? Does it not? This obviously requires time. It's not something you can do last minute. You can't make a website quickly in this way because you do need time for that consultation process to be effective. So asking folks to take a look and you know, perhaps they'll tell you you need captioning or contrast needs to be changed or the structure. So, and we'll get into that in my presentation. We want to just be sure that the accessibility that we're providing is varied enough that we have a, a website that is accessible to, as I say, a wide audience. When you're sharing your content with individuals, 
make sure that you very specifically ask for feedback. Um, and it's something that's ongoing. It doesn't necessarily end because technology is changing all the time. So for example, even with Zoom, Zoom came onto the picture, especially during COVID, it has changed its features exponentially since March. And uh, they recently had an update um, where they've changed features and added really interesting things. So that consultation can be ongoing. Individuals with disabilities can tell you something new they just added. It's incredibly helpful. Be sure to update your Zoom. Be sure to add that feature. I've seen that actually in a lot of situations where Zoom has updated. Um, and one of the criteria to ensuring that you have all those features in place is that not only does the host have to update, but the individuals who are in your meeting need to update as well. So in that case, I'll just say that if you ever do update and have all these features and someone in your audience is saying, I don't have that feature, telling them to log out, update and come back may be the way to solve that. In terms of your disabled community, like I say, they're the ones with the lived experience. They have worked through things. They have had to solve problems, get through barriers. So they're the people to ask. They can tell you the best way to work through a, an accessible content, an accessible website. In the deaf community, we often share information with each other. And often what we discuss can be applicable to other groups. And then we contact those other groups and we find there's a lot of interchange of information. So you may get a lot of varied information from a number of people. So be sure that you consult with a variety of people. So we had research, uh, consultation, and then you get to your testing stage which is similar to what I'd said, how consultation doesn't necessarily end. Um, you could have it as a separate process with different people, or it could be the same people you were consulting with, but it's actually getting people to test your website. And they would be testing things like the design, the navigating of the site, whether there's pop-up windows or not, are they accessible? Is it easy to see? Is the structure straightforward? Um, colors are important, uh, brightness and contrast. Contrast actually is very important. Enough contrast benefits members of our blind and low vision communities. Um, sometimes, for example, I'll spend some time on Netflix watching a movie and they typically will have a very automated style of captioning. Often it's white, just white lettering. But depending on what's happening in the movie, sometimes if the background is white, there's snow or something, suddenly the captioning isn't easy to see and I have to spend more energy to actually read it. So that contrast is lacking in those moments. So that's what I mean when I'm talking about contrast. And in terms of brightness, if it's too bright, it can be hard to see, it can be very fatiguing on the eyes and too dark obviously as well. So testing is really important. Zoom as well, when you're using Zoom, Contrast between skin color and background. If you have a very, very bright white background and you're someone who's using sign language, it'll be very hard to see. Whereas you can see today I'm signing, but I have a black background behind me that's very contrast with my skin tone. And it's easy to be able to see what I'm signing. Uh, the other thing I'm going to speak of language use. Typically, we hear um, eighth grade level is a good level of language to use. But that potentially is still a barrier for a lot of people, people who have lower literacy levels. If we're talking about individuals who don't have English as their first language, then having eighth grade level English may not be accessible to those people or that community. So it's important to think about the community as a whole and their history and what literacy levels they're bringing to the table. And in which case, language that is very simple and to the point can be much more beneficial for that type of audience than language that kind of beats around the bush, is more subtle and nuanced and harder to understand.
I'll actually discuss a little bit more about language use uh, further on in my presentation. For text formatting, in that sense, I'm referring to the structure of the text on a page rather than a whole bunch of text that all runs together, having breaks, having short sentences, not having something that just goes on and on and fills your screen with words. And I mean, at this point too, when we talk about our world at large, attention span is changing. And people don't have the same attention span they used to. Often short chunks of information is much more engaging for people in general. So online can be very overwhelming when you see a lot of text. And people with disabilities have the same type of struggles in terms of attention span, in addition to the nuances of their disability specifically. So definitely language use, or pardon the interpreter, text formatting is something to think about. And I did um, add Um, in terms of if you're having interpretation, you need to think about things like your upload speed. Um, if you have an interpreter, often the, the interpreters lag a little bit in terms of they interpret a little bit behind what's being said. Um, if you're going to be adding videos of interpretation, think about the background, as I've mentioned. I ensure the audio quality and the video quality is very good, not grainy. You can hear the voice clearly. And this is something that definitely needs to be tested, especially if it's something something that you're going to be offering, say, at an event um, or even a promotion piece of material. So in terms of using Zoom for that sort of thing, especially if you're having interpretation is what I'm speaking of specifically, it's good to test that ahead of time. Find that time to set up the Zoom and make sure that that quality is there. Um, I added chat feature on the slide. Um, because sometimes when a chat feature is offered as a way to get help on a website, it can be a barrier. And we know that on Zoom, we have a chat feature, obviously. But it's important, again, to think about the language, that it's language and text being used. And think about other options for your content if someone is struggling to access them and give them the opportunity to ask for that help if they need it. So this disabled audience that we're speaking about, how do they interact? How do they use online media? Well, social media is definitely huge. We'll talk about that. Websites and web pages, just like everybody else. They search for information. They want to access information. And especially at these, during these times, online events via Zoom, live streaming, Facebook, that sort of thing. So social media, definitely important. It's allowing people to connect from all over the world. And you know, this is fairly new for us. I mean, since what, 15 years maybe, that we've had social media really, really take the internet by storm, has a huge impact on everyone. Facebook. Um, definitely popular in the deaf community. Um, it's very visually pleasing. You can find lots of information on events, community events, and connect with people. And that's what I see often on Facebook, at least for the deaf community. You see a lot of events and the live streaming feature. Um, Instagram, again, a very visual platform. If you're using Facebook and Instagram, one thing to, to mention that Althea mentioned is hashtags. And in terms of hashtags, they could be um, hashtag services, uh, hashtag related to tools or the tools that you're providing, um, hashtags that refer to uh, labels in the deaf community, uh, hashtag captions or captioning, hashtag ASL interpreter, Hashtag deaf interpreter. And in terms of um, when we're talking about specific communities, um, deaf culture, a capital D deaf. 
was that last one? Uh, hash, um, CRIP is a term that's used in the disability community. They're reclaiming that term. So typically in the deaf community, CRIP is used, CRIP arts, um, CRIPing the arts. And it's, a, it's an identifier that lets people know where this piece of art is coming from, what community it may be interesting to. But that's a part of your research and your consultation process is to really get a sense of what terms are used that can be used in hashtags that will really garner the attention of this audience. Um, if you're adding audio description, that's a hashtag that could be used. Hashtag audio description, um, hashtag blind, hashtag low vision. Just thinking through a number of the ones that I've seen. When we're talking about websites, websites should be very visually um, engaging and have space and allow someone's eyes to go from one part to another to another. Um, you know, we typically see along the top very clear menus. Those are really helpful for navigation. Make sure those are clear, easy to see. Pictures and visuals, very helpful. Icons, especially pay attention to the icons that you're using. Not only the deaf community, a deaf community really appreciates visual, visual elements, but also if we're talking about individuals who have recently immigrated to Canada, who perhaps English is their second, third or fourth language, icons are incredibly important and generally very recognizable. People know that when they see a little house on an icon, it means back to home. Or they know that if they see a, an icon that has a letter on it, they know that that's to send an email. Um, and navigational buttons like arrows represent very similar meanings, cross languages and cross cultures. So there's lots of ways that you can ensure that your icons are very easily recognizable and they will benefit not only the disability community, but also the populations of pe people who are moving from country to country and still trying to learn the, the language of that country. And I see a lot of icons popping up, especially with social media becoming um, much more popular. There are lots of icons that are very immediately recognizable for each of the social media platforms as well. Um, so colors and contrast, I've actually already kind of spoken about that. Websites and W3. So W3 is your World Wide Web. So you may see W3 representing that WWW. And W3C is a resource central that offers a lot of resources and information on standard practices for creating online content and ensuring that it's accessible to the most amount of people. Um, it talks about um, basic things right down to how to use HTML and coding, how to structure your website and that sort of thing. So it's, it's an actually incredible, incredible website and very worth checking out. That's WC3. So if you're hosting an event, I definitely want to talk about this. Zoom is very popular right now. And I mean, we see it really taking off during COVID, everything has moved online. So we have a lot of features that we can use. We share our screens, as you can see, you can pin individuals that you want to see clearly more so than others. And lately, a new feature that you can pin more than one. You can have a grid view, you can have, there's so many options in terms of your view. Some people like seeing the grid view and seeing everyone who's online whereas other people prefer to, prefer to focus on just the speaker. So again, all those features play a part in making sure that what you're presenting is accessible to your audience. And as we saw at the start of our presentation, um, asking people to have their microphones off at the beginning is incredibly helpful, um, especially if you have a deaf audience and just prompting people to ensure that their microphones are off is important because as deaf people, we may not even know that they're on.
One thing I really like on Zoom as well is ensuring that people are identifying themselves by changing their name on their screen. What I've seen very common is that individuals change the name on their video. Um, they also often put the pronouns that they use. And uh, it's really nice to see that in a meeting. It puts everyone on the same page. And it doesn't out any particular person when everyone shares that information equally. It very much normalizes the various identities that are in the room, and it's incredibly helpful. I mean, and even right now, in terms of what you are, um, what you're enjoying, this meeting is quite accessible because we have captioning, we have the voice from the interpreter, and also we have me signing. So if we had a deaf person in the room, they would also be able to access the lecture through their first language, American Sign Language. So we have three accessible options today. So in terms of formatting, formatting text, formatting audio, video, sign language specifically, and also your images is what I'm going to talk about next. So as I mentioned before, when you're adding text to your online content, think about your font size. You have the option of either enlarging it yourself, choosing the size, or having ways for individuals who are looking at your website to change that font size. When we're referring to the blind and low vision community, typically those individuals already have the technology to change websites as they look at them to increase font size if needed. And But at the same time, there are some website, web pages that have that option, whether it's a Word document or a PowerPoint. Um, here on Zoom, for example, it's kind of limited. So when you're sharing a screen, it's kind of limited to what the host shows you versus having the option to increase or reduce font size when needed. And that may change depending on what they're looking at in terms of the content on a site. Uh, text organization is very similar to what I was talking about before. It's the structure of the text on your website. Do you have pictures and visuals to really um, add emphasis to parts of your text? Is it spaced out even nicely and so that people can read it simply? The last point on this slide is text to speech. Again, blind and low vision community is a community that definitely uses this. Many of them will already have apps, equipment in place that will take text that comes up on their screen and read it out loud to them. And I know that even on Apple phones these days, you can change the speed of the speech. There's lots of different features that you can control. I think also you can control the voice that you're hearing, which is really interesting. It also goes the other way. I'm sure many of you have used spoken language to text. Um, often I'm very jealous of hearing people who aren't deaf because you can speak into your phone and have text written out right away um, automatically, whereas I can't use that. So sometimes that's a little frustrating. That's an awesome piece of technology. So I'm gonna focus a little bit on audio and video right now and what makes them accessible. We know there's a lot of work that goes into creating videos and audio, especially when you get into more professional ways of doing it, lots of equipment, um, and also lots involved in getting it out there, promoting it, ensuring that people see and hear it. So when you're creating audio for your online content, Audio is obviously very accessible to many people. Many people enjoy it, but we also want to keep in mind the deaf community and how will the deaf community access that information. 
ensuring there are controls, whether that's on and off or also volume controls for individuals. Um, you may have individuals who are very sensitive to loud noise and other folks who are losing their hearing and need to turn it up. So if there's a way to offer those options to people so they can control that themselves, all the better. In terms of captions and subtitles, they're different. A lot of people think they're the same, but they're different. Captions, typically, um, we typically see them, for example, here in Canada with English movies, and they are sharing what is happening in the film exactly. So if someone is speaking, we see the captions. They're typically in English. They don't translate anything. They're not going between languages or anything like that. Captions are taking the language that's being presented and putting it into text. Whereas subtitles are a little different. Subtitles typically are what you see when you have um, a film, for example, going from one language to another. So they're translating what's being said into a different language in the subtitles. So we have actually, we have fought for captioning over a long, long period of time. There's a lot more access now. There's a lot more captioning options available, but it's definitely not 100% even now. There are two different types of captions. There's your open captions and your closed captions. Your open captions are captions that are embedded right into the material. They are there, they cannot be turned off. Whereas your closed captions are the ones that an individual could turn on or off as needed. That's really up to them. When you have captions, typically you'll see black background with white text. Sometimes that changes a little bit. Sometimes the size may be different from one to another. Colors sometimes have changed, I've seen that. But the standard is typically black background, white text for that contrast. It's the most contrast you can get and it's the most accessible to the most people. Okay, um, I obviously have to talk about sign language access. As an ASL user, this is something that I work on and that is familiar to me. It's part of my life. What was that? I, I love. One thing to mention about captioning, the interpreter was just clarifying. One thing to mention about captioning is that they are language, they are text. So you may have individuals who struggle with English. And so captioning may not be the best, the best way to give them access. If you have deaf individuals who don't have strong English skills or they're coming from other countries and English isn't their first language, suddenly having English captions to deal with doesn't always solve, solve the problem and give complete access to those people. So you may offer sign language. Sign language is good for individuals who are culturally deaf, perhaps individuals who are um, in the midst of losing their hearing, or individuals too who find the noise that they can hear um, overwhelming, the environmental noise. So they may revert to wanting to see sign language because it's less auditory distraction and it's easier for them to access. So captioning isn't always the way. People assume that when you see sign language, it's English, but signed. And it's not. American Sign Language is its own language. It has its own grammar, its own structure. It is its own language. So you'll notice that, for example, when I'm signing, I have to constantly pause and check up with the interpreter to make sure that she's still on point with what I'm saying, because sometimes I can sign two or three times, but she's going to now have to talk for another two or three sentences in English to make sure that she catches my points and that you have access to them, because English is not American Sign Language. 
uh, American Sign Language is typically much more direct and to the point. Whereas I've noticed that often with English, you get into a lot of subtlety, a lot of nuanced language. Sometimes it doesn't actually mean what was said, that kind of thing. But we don't have that in American Sign Language. It's a very straightforward, direct language, very concrete. Do you have a question? Yeah. Do you want to take the question now or? Sure, yeah, let's do that. That's fine. Okay. Um, I can't see the chat. So please, yeah, if there is any questions, um, I can answer them at the end as well. Okay. Um, are ASL and BSL similar? If I organize an event for both UK and Canadian American audiences, would it be a good practice to have two interpreters? Typically, I will say events often will need two interpreters anyway. Um, I recently had a meeting actually with uh, someone in the UK and they had their interpreters and I had my interpreters because they're different. They're definitely different. So in that kind of event, you'd be looking at at least two. Um, even a simple thing like in American Sign Language, the alphabet is one-handed, ABC, whereas in BSL, it's a two-handed alphabet it's done completely differently. So I don't understand BSL. I think there's there's a very common misconception that sign language is, is an international language and that ASL is used everywhere. But it's it's very much not. It's different in every country as you go around the world. They have their own version of a signed language. And typically that sign language has roots in the language that is spoken in that country. And I mean, every, when we talk about other countries, they have their own spoken language as well. So it makes sense that their signed language has evolved. So when we talk about um, signed languages, often we use that term signed languages in a more broad sense because American Sign Language is really only one of them. Um, and actually here in Canada, we have more than one. We have American Sign Language, we have Langue des Signes Québécois, we have Maritime Sign Language, we have Indigenous Sign Language. So we actually have four, maybe more, within Canada alone. Hopefully that answered your question. Yes, thank you so much. Awesome. That was a really good question. I'm really happy to have, have, have had a moment to talk about that. Because I know that interpretation and sign language may be very new to many people. It's actually becoming a recognized language. Um, but we're still here in Canada working on sign language rights. Um, in many other countries, it is recognized, and we're still working on it here. We're still advocating for that recognition here. I mean, it'd be really interesting in future. I mean, if we saw it as a recognized official language, then we would see more of that provided right across the board, whether we're talking events, um, promotional materials, and that kind of thing, right? So hopefully in future, we'll see a change. So translation versus interpretation. There's a difference. Many people refer to interpreters as translators, but that's not exactly correct. Interpreters are typically live time, real time, as what's happening right now. Translators typically have more time to do the work they need to do. Interpreters, because they're lifetime, have a lot more opportunity and, and uh, space to make mistakes, whereas a translator potentially does not. Because they're working with a piece of material, they may be able to film themselves over and over to ensure that it's accurate, or also they, if they're writing, they have that chance to go back and fix errors, whereas lifetime, an interpreter in the moment will have to recognize that an error has been made and fix it live. Now, typically, interpreters um, avoid errors by having preparation materials, being able to review things ahead of time. 
So if you're running an event or anything like that, it's really important that you pro provide them with the, that material ahead of time. Um, Amanda and Carmel, for example, with this workshop, have interpreted this workshop a few times already. So as we do this workshop over and over again, each time there's less interruptions because they have a much better sense of what's coming. They've already worked through it a number of times. So real time is really good for presentations, meetings, things that are happening live that you want to provide access to. Translation is good for something that you're going to post on the web and it's going to be available for individuals after the fact. And there's time to spend for the person to spend time with it and prepare it. Um, this could be, again, promotional materials or um, recorded type of workshops or pieces of material that you're having translated and then permanently put somewhere to be referred to. But typically, there's more time required for translation and interpretation is happening now. So it's not so much time dependent. So if you had a transcript and you were looking to go from, say, um, sign language to English or English to ASL, which is not interpreting, it's translating. For a deaf person to take, say, 15 minutes of signed content, you'd have to watch that whole video in sign. You're trying to capture everything in English, minimum two hours to work through a short video in sign language to ensure that you, you have that equality between the two pieces and the accuracy. So when I say that you have like a speech to text app, I gotta say, you're very lucky to be able to access that technology. You can imagine if we have to take a video that we've signed or someone has signed and we wanna create a transcript in English so that people can access it, we're looking at hours and hours of work just by nature of what the work is and what it requires. So there, I just wanna add a little bit more to that. So I grew up signing, using the sign language and reading English. My first language is American Sign Language. That is the first language I was exposed to. So I'm much more comfortable using ASL. Things are clearer, I understand better. It's just more comfortable for me. It's my first language. Now, I can function in both, but if we're talking about it from a linguistics perspective, the, a person's first language is the one that they are most comfortable in. It's their native language. Even if you become incredibly fluent in a second, it's still that first language that has that 100% comfort. Like I can work in English comfortably, but if I had a choice, I would use American Sign Language. Um, in English, especially if I'm working through a text, there's idioms, there's metaphors, and you have to learn all those one at a time because growing up, I didn't hear that. I didn't hear people using idioms around me and metaphors. So there are things in English that you see and know immediately that I as a deaf person was not exposed to and actually have to very specifically ask about. Whereas in sign language, I know that I'm going to understand fully. So English requires more energy for me. I can do it, but it requires more energy and more focus. Whereas sign language is so much more natural. That's my language. So for me and many other deaf people, you'll find that if you gave them a choice, they're going to choose a sign language. And it depends on the person. It depends on what they were exposed to from the very beginning. Okay, alternative text or alt text. There are a couple of ways to do this. Often in HTML, there's a way to add a description sort of in the back end behind a photo. And the text looks similar to what's on the screen here. So toward the bottom, you can see your opening parenthesis, IMG SRC. Then you have the name of your photo. And then after this particular intro and your, your equal symbol, you get into a description. So this description says this photo has a white background with a medium sized pink peony flower in a black glossy vase. Mm -hmm. 
this is another way to approach alt text. Rather than using the coding, if you're posting a picture, you can put the description in what you're typing about that picture right up front on the page. That can accommodate individuals of the blow and light, low vision, blind and low vision communities. And really this description can be, can be as detailed as you would want it to be. So this description is very similar, but as you can see, it's part of the text at the bottom. Image description, colon, this photo has a medium sized red pink peony flower in a dark textured gray vase on a light gray background. So this type of alt text image description is a little bit more descriptive. Whereas the alt text that I had on the previous slide was a little simpler. There's no perfect way to do it. Um, the amount of detail that you add um, is up to you. I mean, the more artistic, especially if we're talking about arts and arts organizations, the more you can add to it, the more description you can add to it to really give someone a full sense of what the visual they're seeing is all about, the better. When you're creating promotional materials, perhaps it's for an event, you obviously want people to maybe check out your website, go to um, a certain page, click on your link. You wanna make sure that the promotional materials themselves are accessible. So to ensure that the most amount of people can see and access your promotional materials, um, you can send them to disability organizations, ask them to disseminate, the information to their audiences. So think about who you're targeting and how to target specific communities that may not know otherwise. So when you're creating promotional materials, note what you're offering for access services. Is there, is there braille options? Will there be interpretation? Is there captioning? What type of access features will be at your event or what have you? What you're offering. So put what you're offering and not what you're not offering. You'll get more response that way. And also ensure that you um, add some type of contact. So whether that's email or phone numbers, often individuals from the disability community have questions. They want to ensure that a certain piece of access is going to be in place for them. So they need a way to be able to follow up and ask about those things. So having those access features in place is very important. And what comes with that is ensuring that you're thinking about access features at the very beginning, far in advance from what you're planning, rather than having it as an afterthought once everything is already in place. Um, tech support. Often what I see, if this is something that applies to your content, often there is a phone number. Phone numbers are not helpful to everyone. Live chat can be amazing, email addresses, even a phone number that can be text, ensure that it says that you can use text. Um, and also, you can also make a note that someone can phone through uh, virtual relay interpreting services, which is similar to an operating service. Um, um, but you can use those, you can make sure that those services are mentioned on your website that someone can use them. Um, I just want to pause. Is there any questions? So I'm just going to pause right now and see if there are any questions that have come up. If anyone wants to ask anything, since I can't see the chat, there is all... a question. Um, if your audience speaks English and French, would you recommend writing image descriptions in both languages? Well, if your website, yeah, if your website is catering to English and French individuals, I would say that your image description should follow that for sure. So could I add, Sage, um, I was researching this today because I was looking at Indigenous languages and the recommendation I saw was say uh, you have an English site and you have a French site, you follow the language on each site. You don't necessarily combo a language on one site or a one version of your site. It would be good to look in best practices to how to handle multi-language.
Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, yeah, if you have someone who is coming from a Spanish background, like, I mean, what sign language, right? If we start talking about sign languages, you're, you're talking definitely about multi-languages because it's a different language in sign or a spoken. Um, and also, if we're talking about Spanish languages, there are different Spanish signed language, pardon, if we're talking about Spanish signed languages, that was the interpreter making an error, um, there are different types of Spanish signed languages. Are you talking about Spain? There are different dialects in Spain. Are you talking about Mexico? That's a completely different sign language. Just seeing, was there anything else? No, no other questions before I go on? Oh, pardon the interpreter, before I hand it over to Barb. Uh, there is. Is there a tool available that can help the deaf community appreciate music? Or would a descriptive paragraph be helpful on what the music sounds like? Okay, that's, uh, that's an interesting question. I suggest you research Christine. And the last name is Sun Kim, S-U-N-K-I-M. Christine is a deaf musician, artist. And they have a lot of content related to music. And I mean, typically when you're watching captions, you see music in parentheses and that's it, right? But Christine Sun Kim um, makes music visual. She, she shows what it looks like. Um, she may draw it. Um, she may use American Sign Language or a signed language. Um, it's a great resource. There's a great video from her available about captioning music. Huh. And it, it just, when you see the video, it just changes everything. Parenthesis, there's music. There are a couple music notes versus what what she's doing and she's adding descriptors and more energy and almost like a, a rhythm to the way that she's representing the music. It's amazing. And it's quite new. Um, I mean, there are deaf people who um, very much appreciate music. And I mean, there are apps that I think are in development to try and sort of work with that, describing music and trying to make it accessible in one way or another. Um, in terms of music too, it can be very much appreciated by deaf individuals just due to the vibrations of the music. There are a lot of new inventions out there right now, like vests that you can wear that pick up on the vibrations. Um, there are areas and places that have established almost like platforms. And if you're sitting on them underneath you, you're feeling that vibration. Um, also, Vibra Fusion Lab in, Lo in uh, London, it includes a deaf, hard hearing artist, and they are focused on making music more accessible. Vibra Fusion Lab, definitely worth checking them out as well. I've, I've talked with a lot of my deaf friends and we've noticed that um, there's, when you're talking about music, there's sort of two different ways that people go. There's the lyrics, there's your lyrical music, and then there's also describing what the music is. Is it a violin? Is it slow? Is it fast? Is it sad? What's the emotive qualities? So there's all these levels that people are interested in. They want to know what's being sung or they want to know what, what is it making you feel when you hear it? What kind of instruments are being used? I think a lot of people often assume that, well, deaf people don't do music. They don't like music. But a lot of deaf people love music and they access it in a variety of ways. I think um, music too is there, there's so much involved in it, right? Repetition and the vibration and the feel that it gives you. So yeah, definitely worth a conversation. Thank you. That's wonderful information. Uh, says Emily. Yeah, thank you for that question. If we have no more questions, I think I'm headed over to you, Barb. All right. Thanks so much, Sage. There's also opportunity at the end if you think of anything uh, you'd like to ask. Yeah, so 
I'll share my screen for sure this time. <laughs> Uh, can you see my screen? Anybody? Yep. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. I know that everybody's probably getting hungry. It's almost lunchtime. So uh, we've got about 20 more minutes to go. Now, Sage and Elsea have given you a tremendous amount of information, a lot of tips on what to do today to improve your delivery of your content, make it more findable, make it accessible. Now, what I'm going to talk about is the future. What ways uh, are, what, how is technology changing so that audiences can find and, whoa, can find content, but also how is technology impacting how we can deliver content? I'm going to talk about Internet of Things, uh, voice technology, um, artificial intelligence is having a big impact on our content uh, worlds and the exponential growth of content and how it's going to impact us. And finally, a little bit on alternatives to internet giants. So the first thing I wanna talk about is Internet of Things. It's a great title, isn't it? Internet of Things <laughs> or IOT as it's called. This is a network of devices that are connected to the internet. For example, the top image is a smart speaker and about 15% of Canadians have smart speakers. They range in price from 50 bucks to several hundred dollars, and you can interact with them using your voice. Then of course, there's smart watches, which these tiny little devices, uh, you can look at the internet. You can look up events, like I mentioned at the very beginning, and anything that can be found on a website. Of course, there's also smart refrigerators. You've probably all heard of the example where you can get your fridge to order your milk for you. <laughs> um, so why do we care about these things? We care because we want our content as artists and art organizations to surface in these places. Anywhere where users have, um, you, anywhere where our audiences are accessing content, we want our content to surface there. So what's been happening over the last couple of years is that increase in numbers of IoT devices. There's going to be trillions around the world, as well as the advancement of machine learning and speech recognition means that there's an increase in voice capabilities. That means a lot of things. There's voice to text as uh, Sage mentioned and how it can aid accessibility. Also voice search. I don't know if anybody uh, in the call has actually tried out voice search on their phone or their website. Um, you know, it can be frustrating. We can, you can be asking Google questions and you never get the right answer. Um, but really what, what is driving that is behind the voice search is machine learning and speech recognition. And there's been so many advancements. It's maybe more like 80% accurate now, instead of in the past, it was maybe only 50%. So I'm gonna play an example of what a smart home speaker can do. This is a Google Home Mini, an example of a smart home speaker. It costs about $70 and you can put it anywhere in your home. It requires Wi-Fi to work. Let's try it out. Okay, Google, find me Toronto filmmakers. Liaison of Independent Filmmakers of Toronto is on 1137 DuPont Street in Toronto and is 1.1 kilometers away. Okay, Google, find me independent animators. According to Wikipedia, independent animation is animated short cartoons and feature films produced outside the professional Hollywood animation industry. Okay, Google, find me art organizations in Vancouver. Organizations frequently mentioned on the web include the Vancouver Art Gallery, the Emily Carr University of Art and Design, the Contemporary Art Gallery, and others. All right. Oops. So if you'd like to check out if you as an artist or your organization shows up on a smart speaker, you have to either purchase one, you know, you can get one that I think this little mini now you can get for $60 at, you know, any tech store. Um, or you can 
can just borrow one from a friend and try it out, ask it a few questions. Do you surface uh, through voice? And if you don't, what you have to do is sort of go back to what um, Althea was saying very early on about structuring your content, making your content simple, and you can experiment on your site um, in places where your content is shared uh, to make sure that your information surfaces. Now, why it's um, important is even in, whoops, this is an example of US-based uh, Alexa donations. So right now, Alexa, created by Amazon, uh, enables financial transactions, but all of the voice devices do. The problem is, is that humans don't like to send money by voice through smart speakers. <laughs> humans like to do it when uh, they have voice and images. But in these cases, these nonprofit organizations in the US are already getting donations via voice, via Alexa. So you could, for example, say you've got a com comic art event coming up in Vancouver and you wanna promote your event and you wanna sell tickets via voice, you can do it. Anybody can access the back end of Amazon, Google, uh, Siri to set up these queries and enable financial transactions. Of course, it's a bit of work. You'd have to have a developer do a little bit of work for you, but soon it's gonna be worth it because voice will grow exponentially. Now, well, we've mentioned that voice does add a level of accessibility. Oh, I'll give you one great example. Um, I saw this workshop by Brooke McCall, who's with the Tech Access Initiative in the US. And Brooke usually uses a human assistant to do various tasks for her because of her physical disability. For example, to turn off the lights or to put the blinds down. But now if there's smart home devices that do these things, like there are smart lighting uh, systems, she can use voice to do it. She can go, okay, Google, turn down the lights um, and something like that. I don't understand. Uh, sorry, I'm just gonna move my phone away. I forgot to. <laughs> Respond. Okay, Google comments. Um, so now that is great and wonderful. So now this voice to text technology is adding another layer, which is visual interpretation. And so for example, there's Google, Google home devices now with displays. Now you've watched so much content today that I'm gonna give you a little break and play a little creative story. This is based on a story written by Althea who was presenting earlier. And it's an example of a Google Home speaker creative project. Now I'm just giving you a clip. I'm not gonna play the whole thing for you. Um, it will hopefully be available on the web generally, maybe in January. Uh, okay, here's the test version of female, fear and future. Would you like to hear an unsettling Subway encounter or an action packed superhero adventure? Please say Subway or Superhero. Subway. When you step inside the Subway car, the first thing you notice is how empty it seems for 7 o'clock on a Wednesday night. In one corner, a young couple sit silently side by side. You sit down at a window seat and pull out your phone to look at your shopping list. You decided to make an impromptu trip to the fancy grocery store. Someone plops themselves into the seat next to you. You glance over. The man is around 40, tall and broad, like a construction worker. You feel dwarfed by his presence. You look around and notice that the other seats around you are all empty. It's strange. You think, then he shows the seat right next to you. You examine him out of the corner of your eye, and he's staring straight ahead. Maybe he didn't even realize all the other seats were empty. Maybe he just walked into the subway. The one next to you, but he's a big guy, and sitting between him and the subway window, you feel a little cramped and trapped almost. There are still seven more stops to go. Should you just get up and change seats? But his legs are long, and you'll have to ask him to move out of your way. He might get offended. What if he didn't mean to make you so uncomfortable? 
you feel resentful, you were sitting there first. At the next station, you silently open his stop, but the door is open and closed. He's still sitting there. His leg starts to press against yours. He's manspreading, taking up more and more space, his thigh in full contact with yours. You don't like it. Choose to stay for a while. Speak up. All right, so that creative project is part of, part of a group of four women called Female Fear and Future. Um, and we're using the voice to text technology behind Google Home speakers to create that translation um, on the go, if you will. That voice is Google's voice, uh, a, a voice you can choose to use from Google. Now you wonder, what does this have to do with search? <laughs> so, <laughs> Through these examples, I kind of want to show you how voice to text works and some of its benefits and limitations. So one point I'd like to make, like, for example, if you're a book author, you could choose to use an online distributor that has both text and audio. That will make your content more accessible and using these devices, smart speakers and whatnot will also make your content uh, more accessible, making sure that your content surfaces in these places. So in summary about voice, if you think about everything that I'll say and Sage said, a lot of what they talked about is how we type and search words or text to find something. Even when we're searching an image, we're not really searching the image, we're searching the text around the image and same goes for video. We're searching the text around video. But now because of this new technology, our search is widening so that now we're using voice. We're using another sense, if you will. And so now I'm gonna talk about other technological changes that are also gonna impact the way in which we'll do search. So I'm gonna talk about artificial intelligence and how, well, I've actually just been artificial intelligence, but I'm gonna talk now about other ways in which it will impact us and our digital sharing of content. I'm going to talk about things like how it measures emotion or measures behavior, how we're gonna be able to use automated keywords and also visual content analysis with AI. So right now the technology exists to measure an emotional reaction to art. And this works through measuring facial expressions and you know, there's some coding in the back end which says this expression means they really like the painting, this one means they don't. Of course, this is up to cultural interpretation because uh, for example, I could be seriously studying the painting uh, that's on this slide uh, and I look as somebody else might interpret it as I look angry. So this kind of AI interpreting what people think or say uh, has also been used in negative stereotyping in work situations or policing. But I think what's going to, I watched this great presentation by the Lakota AI initiative. And one thing I learned, what they said was AI in itself is not bad. It depends on the people who code it. Like if it's coded with stereotypes, yes, it will result in furthering stereotypes, negative stereotypes that we don't want. Um, so why is it beneficial to us, I guess? Or what, how do we look at it in terms of search? Now, as I said, we're searching using text. We could search searching for emotion. Can you give me something that is happy? You know, and instead of searching text, the AI is actually searching our reaction to something or what, how other people have already reacted to something and measuring that. Or for example, there's technology that measures the emotion of words that's used by customer service organizations. Okay, customer X said, yada, yada, yada. They're really angry. <laughs> Would we as artists or art organizations use this to understand the reaction to our events or our art creation, our books, what we write? Could you use it on the fly? Anyhow, I'm getting a little off the search topic. So let me move on and talk more about search. 
The next one I want to talk about is behavior. So most of you have probably tried out AR or VR, augmented reality, virtual reality, or XR. Now what's important in this kind of art is people are not just looking and talking, they're also interacting, making choices within the game. So how search could look at this is interpreting behavior. Why did a person move this way? What did it mean when they moved that way? Where do most people move? That kind of thing. This can give information to the creators also to tell them what is the most advantageous way to plan a game, for example. In a way, with search at the beginning, we tapped and typed, and now we're gonna interact, we're gonna understand emotion. There's so much a broader way in which search can impact our world. Content management systems. Um, so content management systems are the systems we use to create online content like WordPress, Adobe, uh, Wix, all these third party sites that many of us use to make a site. So these content management systems are creating ways that you could automate keywords. Instead of having to do all the work that Altea and Sage laid out, the content management system itself would do it. Now, both Adobe and WordPress have already set up to do this. But on the Adobe backend, they put the AI interface and the human driven one side by side. And the reason is the AI one is not good enough yet. Say it's 80% accurate. Humans can still analyze and interpret text and figure out what is a good keyword better than any machine. And it's gonna be a while before AI can advance enough to understand all that multi-layered human analysis. In the same way, these systems are also analyzing images. So as I mentioned just a couple of minutes ago, right now search analyzes text. It can't really analyze an image itself. But what Adobe is trying to do is set up an image search. So an image, so the AI is actually programmed and used to understand an image. I'd like to find an image of a red flower. So the the AI search system can actually go out there and look for the image. It's no longer looking for the text that surrounds the image, but it's looking at the image. So what this means for us in the future is the images, the thumbnails and et cetera that we use have to be really uncluttered. They have the silhouettes are good, profiles are good, images that really clearly say what the um, content is about. And that's good for anybody actually even if we're not trying to make an image surface for AI search engines. <laughs> this is not common use right now, but it will become more common in the next couple of years. Ah, so just to summarize, artificial intelligence is impacting us in huge ways when it comes to search. The way in which we can search and what we can search, searching emotions, searching um, you know, what is in an image, searching behavior, it just really broadens uh, this world from text and typing. The other thing that's really going to impact search is the huge growth of media. At the very beginning of the presentation, I mentioned 5G and how 5G will increase the pipeline for content. And there's so much content already being created. It will grow exponentially. So what that means is that our ability to surface our own content within that world is even more important. I want to talk about data ports and content aggregators and the role they're going to play. So a data port is just a concept. It's not like an external drive that sits there. It's a concept. A data port is a worldwide network of structured content, which is searchable by people and machines. So everything that Sage and Althea laid out is not only are people reading your stuff, machines are reading it. Machines are interpreting you, what you're posting online to show to other people. They're interpreting your text and soon it's gonna be interpreting your images. Um, video will probably follow. And so if we want our content to live in that data port or data pool, um, as some people are calling it, uh, data lake actually is what people are calling it. Then we have to structure our content to be there. It ha we have to keep our content simple and follow the structured, simple structure um, that say Wix or WordPress or any of these sites recommend. 
because there's so much content and because technology is enabling the display of so much content, I don't know if any of you remember, even five years ago, it was difficult to put big videos up online. But now we have Vimeo, YouTube with thousands, millions of videos. We have TripAdvisor where you can post your event. You can sell tickets to your art organization's um, you know, fundraiser or any event for that matter. Individual artists post events on there. And then we have Etsy where you can sell all your art. I think we'll only see an increase in content aggregators um, because of this, because the amount of content and technically we can actually display content in these ways. Each of these content aggregators have, have their own search, uh, search engine requirements. So if you're going to use them, you need to just read up a little bit on what they require. Most of them have very structured content. So out of the box, you're gonna follow that guideline. Um, so it's just going a little step further and making sure that you fill out be it tags or keywords they're asking for. Um, whatever to help your content, like say your paintings, to surface within the busy world of Etsy. So overall, we're going to see a massive increase again in content. We're going to see the pipeline increase to enable it to be displayed all over the place. And finally, the message is the same as we've been saying throughout, and that is keeping your content simple. Throughout this presentation today, we talked a lot about internet giants, Google, Facebook, YouTube, Vimeo, I guess, could be in that world now. And so I was curious to think, what are alternatives? What can we as artists and art organizations, do we simply have to follow what Google is telling us to do? Or is there something else we can do? So we'll just have a brief look at this. There's This topic is huge, and we only have time for a little bit. OK, first of all, I've got four examples here. On the bottom right, I want to talk about OP Robots. OP Robots uses AI to teach Indigenous languages um, to youth. And this is kind of great because if you think if your language is not translated by Google, you're at a disadvantage in search or displaying of content. For example, worldwide, Google only translates three Indigenous languages, but we know there are thousands also. You can impact this by going on the Google Translate page and putting in a comment, hey Google, I think you should translate X language. Translating more languages enables more people to access search. Oh, that's my phone again, sorry. Um, let's see, what else do I wanna say? So you can help by contributing to this, but also um, there's a final point I wanted to make about translation. Oh yes, Google prefers to translate languages that have uh, a, are written, not just spoken. And that is a problem. I think in the long run, we'll see a change in that. We'll see that spoken languages can go the other way to text also. And that will open up those languages for search. Um, the top right one or left one, a free web. I don't know if you've heard of Sir Tim Berners-Lee. He created something called the World Wide Web that we are all using right now. And he gave it to the world for free. Many, many companies, of course, want to make profits off of the web. There's been many lawsuits around the world about this issue. So Berners-Lee created the World Wide Web Foundation and he's advocating for a free web where we can get around the big internet giants like Google and we can operate on the web without having to worry about Facebook owning our, con our, our data, that kind of thing. In Toronto, there's a small company called Bubble and what they're working on with broadcasters across Canada is creating a human uh, set up keyword tagging to offset AI stereotypes that are dogging our world. This is particularly important for broadcasters because they put so much content out in the world. And we'd like to see Canadian broadcasters that don't use keyword stereotypes and that we can search their content uh, with appropriate keywords. And finally, at the bottom, blockchain and edge computing. I won't say a lot. There's tons to say about these things, but they're two new technologies that may enable us to own our own data and um, distribute it as we want across the search, across the, the big data lake, all these kinds of things. Um, this could apply to artists and art organizations as well. It's not like we have to know that technology. There'll be probably interfaces created or you know, open source creation of, of, 
uh, features that will enable us to do this. So there's a million projects going on around the world to create alternatives to internet giants to enable us to get around things like Google search and not have to be so focused on uh, altering our content to meet their world. But it's little initiatives all over the place. So any support we give to them is great. So that's actually it for this section. Are there any questions? No. Oh. Okay, no questions. Oh, I do want to, I just need to say one thing. I'm sharing my screen. So big thank you. Uh, here's the credits. I would like to say a big thank you to the Canada Council for the Arts who enabled us to do the research and put together this series of, of workshops. And also a huge thank you to Joyce and the BC Alliance for Arts and Culture for hosting this workshop and enabling us to share everything that we learned. And also finally, a big thanks to ASL interpreters, Amanda Hyde and Carmel Cachero. Thanks guys for being with us through this journey. There'll be, as I mentioned at the beginning, there's a full version of the research that can be found soon at ima.ca uh, in their source library. It's not live now, but it will be live in probably in about a week. So thank you so much for attending everybody. And now I'll turn it over to Joyce for final words.